Hello, hello, it's Kenyon again, and I am here to continue talking about things that I, just my thoughts on um, the overall season. Today, this specific video is going to be more focused on my thoughts on Maasai, as well as probably a little bit about the roster construction and a little bit about the bench. Let's talk about Maasai first. The good. In my opinion, if you have won a championship ever, you get a five-year pass. The problem is we're coming up on year five. This next season will be year five. So I think you get a pass for anything that can go bad or wrong. You, If you want to experiment or do something crazy or trade everyone, you've earned the right to do that. I think I think that's what it earns you. It earns you trust, uh, both from the people as well as from your bosses, your organization as well. Now, that being said, I look at this roster and Vision 6-9. I think positionless basketball works. I think we see a lot of it throughout the NBA. I think the way that they did it, and it's not I'm, I'm not fully blaming Masai, but the way that they did it was probably not the best. Um, there are, when I say Masai, I mean Masai Ujiri and Bobby and just the overall management side of the organization. And I think that they, they kind of got themselves into a, 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 a few pickles. Uh, I'm going to focus on this year. Um, but obviously do have to talk about the championship. So they did win a championship and that is really the good part of it to win the championship now. This is where we're getting into the questionable. They did have to trade um, picks to do that. Now, the, the trading of the picks is not questionable in and of itself. Won the championship. The challenging thing is that after you win the championship, and I'm not even mad at them not getting stuff for Marc Gasol. Uh, Marc Gasol was done. Um, I don't know what you were going to get for Marc Gasol. I don't know what you were going to get for Serge Ibaka, who had back problems that year. I think the challenging thing is that Masai tends to wait and go for big fish, big moves. And he sometimes misses out on the smaller moves that could be made. I will give you an example of a big fish move that he tried to make, too. He tried to sign, reportedly, Rudy Gobert. Uh, he was clearing cap space to sign Rudy Gobert. He was also clearing cap space to sign Giannis Antetokounmpo. Those both happened in the same offseason. It did not happen. And for that reason, you waited to sign guys. Um, I think that free agency has changed. I don't think that we can just wait anymore. Uh, teams don't wait unless you are the Lakers and clear a b bunch of cap space to sign a dude. I don't think that that's it. I think sign and trades are going to be the way of the future, and we saw that over the past two years, and you're going to see more of that this year is sign and trades. It's just that's what the CBA is facilitating. That is um, just better asset management, et cetera, et cetera. And that's fine. But you have to make the move. Some of the smaller moves that we, um, or actually before I get into that, another big move was trying to get Kevin Durant. Now, I was all in on that. But at the same time, I'm not in those negotiations, so I don't know how serious they were. And trying to keep the powder, you know, dry for that type of move, okay, I understand it. But at the same time, you also miss out on other moves. For example, getting a Derek White or a DeJounte Murray or a Rui Hachimura. Um, there were other moves that we could have made to make our team better from a talent perspective overall. And we didn't make those moves. We didn't make them in part because we were doing that. And then what I've noticed with Masai is he tends to or the front office tends to wait. They don't like making trades in season. I'm not saying that they don't, but they don't like making trades in season. And I understand that you can disrupt chemistry, but at times there's, you got to make a trade in season. And they try to do this negotiating tactic where they wait till last minute. You look at things like the miles Turner. We were close to a miles Turner trade, but they waited and waited and waited. And then all of a sudden our pick was no longer eighth, this is a year ago before this year, uh, it being 2023. Um, and as our pick rose up the standings in the reverse order, um, 
it was no longer a, a valuable pick. It was no longer the eighth best odds of of whatever. And so now, I mean, now you've just lost out on Miles Turner. Um, and instead, you go for Thaddeus Young. I like Thaddeus Young. Um, I did not like the price that we paid for Thaddeus Young, and I thought that that kind of a move for Goran Dragic could have been done earlier. I know other people were like, I, I would have rather had Goran Dragic because he said nice things about Scotty or whatever. I really don't care about that. Dude didn't want to be here. Dude was playing in Miami on, like, at, you know, not the local Y, but, like, at practice facilities and stuff like that. He didn't want to be here. And he didn't present himself as the best vet, to be perfectly honest. And he did actually start to start the season, but it was a bad fit. Now, that being said, you probably could have played him more. This goes back to uh, the nurse thing the other day uh, that I that I said. Um, you could have played him more, for sure. But either way, you've decided that you didn't want the Goran Dragic thing. Um, they could have played a uh, harder ball with Miami at times, but at the same time, I, I'm glad that they didn't play hard ball because, um, you know, too much, because you could have ended up with nothing. At the same time, you the result was to help out Kyle, you ended up with Goran Dragic, and that meant that you couldn't go after guys as easily say, uh, you know, Rashawn Holmes, who we were close to getting as well. Um, but I think that it was the, the the term length of the deal that that held that back. I think there's deals that they've made in terms of player contracts that are confusing. Why did they give Svi Mihailuk? All respect to Svi, but there's no reason for them to have given him a player option. It, there was no reason for that. Uh, and a fully guaranteed player option. Um there was the Gary Trent thing. You have your restricted rights on a guy. What leverage does this guy have to sign two years? If you don't like the guy, then why did you trade for him? I know that there was rumors of them wanting Malik Monk, and I understand why that didn't happen because at the time, LaMelo got injured, and they didn't want to make a a push towards the playoff uh, with Norman Powell because they didn't really see there to be any value. Fair enough, but if you wouldn't have waited, maybe you would have been able to get something. I don't know how close we were to the maxi thing, right? Um, trying to extract more. If maxi was, you know, I like my Kentucky guards. If maxi was seriously on the table as a, um, you know, in a trade package for, uh, for, for Lowry, that would have put us, and, and we were holding out for a Matisse Thibel. That is a mistake. Now, again, not in those. I'm not in the room. I'm just based on, on what the reports were and stuff like that. I don't know how close they were to that uh, the, in terms of reality, but yeah. Josh Hart and the seventh pick for OG. Now, some people may have their thoughts about OG being a second option or a, even I've heard as high as a 1A, 1B option. Personally, I think uh, OG provides something special on both ends of the ball. I do not see him as a um, type one or two player. I see him as a third option, uh, mainly because of the fluidity thing, and he's getting a little old to, for that to significantly change in terms of how your bones fuse and that sort of thing. Um, but regardless, you probably could have had a player by all accounts and by the numbers who would have given you at least 70% of what OG gives you. Um, actually probably a little bit more, to be honest, I've looked at the numbers. So say 80 to 85%, I think 85% was the actual number. So 85% of what OG gives you on the defensive end, um, he actually probably gives you a little bit more on the, on the, uh, sorry, on the, on the defensive end. And he gives you more on the offensive end from a consistency standpoint. Um, both are, you know, somewhat injury, but then you also could have had the seventh pick. You could have had a younger player who was on a rookie scale contract. You could have had Sharp, um, if you believe in Sharp. You could have had um, Ben Matherin, if you believe in Ben Matherin. You could have had a number of other guys that would also allow you. And especially if this guy, if you're not going to get rid of um, certain guys, whether you feel it's Pascal, whether you feel it's more Fred, um, whatever camp you're in, from that perspective, if you're either not going to change the whole offense around and you're going to have the same personnel and expect a different result without outlining and helping to define the roles as management in conjunction with coaching, then you've kind of 
you've contributed to the situation. I think the other thing is going back to the lack of draft picks. Sure, there's undrafted guys, um, but by waiting too long in free agency to make moves, um, in general, I'm not mad at the auto porter uh, thing, and I think it will work out next year. But in general, you're looking at us trying. We like it seems like management knows what the problems have been. Like, okay, this problem's a center. Okay, go get an actual center. Don't be cheap about it. Don't be. Don't waste time. Go get it. If you think Miles Turner is the guy? Then get get the guy. Right. Don't. You know, instead of being rumored for Miles Turner from now until the time he's Thaddeus Young's age, and then go get him and say, "Oh, we finally got our guy," right? Go, just go get the guy early, right? Don't waste time. I don't understand why we are wasting time, and I think that that's one thing that I would hope for the future. The other thing too is that, and I don't know, this depends on internal discussions, but if a guy doesn't want to be here, I'm gonna. Use OG as an example. If there's the true rumor that he doesn't want to be here, um, and this has come up a couple times, and there's not really a quick remedy for it, then extract what you can from him. Now, with that being said, do it before the deadline so that you're, unless, you, you know, he is the guy, right? I think that's the difference between having a KD is that you can wait till the deadline and then make the move. But if you're not going to put that level of a guy out there, then you have to make those moves earlier. Now, if if it's really subpar, fair enough. And I, like I said at the beginning of this, I think we will see that some of the assets that weren't moved on from uh, will be moved now because I think some of those teams will have regrets and will may be a little bit more aggressive, especially since the free agent market is a little bit subpar and not everyone that had um, cap space has cap space right now. But yeah, I think that there are smaller moves um, that they could have made. And I think that right now we're in a place where, at least from a bench standpoint, and this is going to get me to the bench side of the conversation, we've really lacked a number of things. We've lacked, for example, simple, offensive initiation, um, dynamic guards, and dynamic guard depth. Um, Regardless of whether or not you believe Barnes is a point guard, and I think that he can be a primary offensive initiator. Right, I, I I don't believe in positions. I believe in roles, and I think that he can be a primary offensive initiator in the half court. Um, but it will take a little bit of time. And I said that two years ago on others' podcasts and shows and stuff like that. I'm sticking to that. I said that it would take two years at least to get hit a shot. And I said like even with that, I said by the end of this year, I said that Pascal would probably be undisputedly probably the best player on the team. Those have proved true so far. Um, that is not an indictment on Barnes, by the way. I'm just saying that this is how like development is not linear in the NBA. It's definitely not exponential for most players either. Um, so yeah, back to the bench. With the bench, uh, I'm just going to grab this, make sure that it's off. With the bench, I think that we could have used, at bare minimum, a shift away from the redundancy. Redundancy is good because if someone goes out, you have someone else to fit that skill set. But if you have too much redundancy, you, because there's limited spots, the salary caps league, um, you miss out on providing value in other areas. Um, we should have had a fail safe in case a, an auto porter where it's going to go down. We could have used more shooters. We could have used a guy, you know, for those who like Tyus Jones, we could have used a guy like Tyus Jones. Now, I'm not saying that we could have got Tyus Jones, but I'm using that player type as a skill set that's to say that we could have used that. I think you look, even just honing in on specific players, between Boucher, uh, I understand that provides a bit better playmaking. Um, so between Boucher, Thad, and Precious, you're basically having guys that more or less have very similar skill sets. They provide length. Yes, Precious provides um, the ability to guard one through five, but they're basically all providing a high level of, or hopefully high level of defense in in theory um, with some length and stuff like that. Um, I think that management at bare minimum needs to choose between one of those three and let the others go. 
it's too much redundancy and you can shore up that depth to get depth in other areas. Um, now, the other thing is that Flynn and Banton and Jeff Doughton. Um, if you're going to be drafting a guy, you're probably drafting a guy that's probably, my guess, is going to be more of a guard or at least a shooter. Shooter as in it could be Taylor Hendricks or it could be um, Grady, you know, Grady Dick. If it is one of those two guys, um, the, the latter two guys, then that's different. Um, they, I think Grady can definitely be a, 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 at least a secondary offensive initiator off the bench. But I guess what I'm getting at is that you don't really currently have an initiator. Flynn, for those of you who are Flynn fans, Flynn currently does not do a good job of initiating the offense. He is decent at initiating his own offense and looking for his own shot. He kind of profiles right now in terms of his style of play, aside from the size of player that he is, if you look at the style of play, he profiles more of a shooting guard or at least a shoot first guard. Um, might be several reasons for that. Uh, it could be because of the lack of playing time or whatever, but he is not providing offensive initiation. The closest person to doing that is Jeff Doughton. Jeff Doughton is not young. He's like 26, I think, um, without like looking it up. Um, I expect Jeff Doughton back. Um, but I guess my point is, is that it's not, I'm, I'm not trying to make an indictment on Flynn, but instead I'm trying to point out that you need a guy off the bench in the future um, and moving forward who can provide skill sets that you do not have and skill sets, more importantly, that you need. It took way too long to pair consistently Siakam with with GTJ, like off the bench. Like that is just obvious. Pair him with a shooter instead of pairing them with no shooters. It's one thing to say, okay, Siakam, you can be the spacing threat or whatever. Sure. And maybe he does need to work on a shot. Sure. Although I think that it's close. I mean, between now and two years ago, he has shot between 34 to 30. I might be getting this year's wrong. Um, might be like just under 34, but in general, like let's say 34 to 37%, like a smidge under that is probably where I would expect Siakam to shoot. And I think that that's fair, especially if you're not overworking him and, and stuff. I expect Barnes to shoot better, probably closer to 32%. That's shooting well enough. You can make this work if everyone shoots well enough, but you need at least one other guy on the bench who can be more consistent. Gary can be that, you know, that spark plug, but you need someone who can consistently create for others and help create for others. And you need a little bit more than that as well. Um, and finally, I think on the bench, you need a point of attack defender. You can't have OG out uh, hanging out there to dry the, the entire game. I think that it gets tedious. It gets tiresome. Um, the best way to explain our system was it's exacting. I don't think that management gave the top players, particularly Siakam and Barnes, I will say, the tools to succeed. I asked at a Raptors Republic party, um, there's a lot of questions that were asked, and they went to me and I asked a simple question. Have we ever built around Siakam? And by proxy, in my mind, I'm thinking that also means building around Barnes. I think you can build around both, but I think it starts with the bench at bare minimum of getting shooters, getting people, you know, instead of saying we're going to teach everyone the Nick Nurse pill and they can learn how to shoot, or as some people say, all these projects, I think it's okay to have projects, but you need projects who have different skill sets instead of all these projects working on the same thing and then not having enough minutes around to go around for them to work on and hone that skill. I think if you have someone working on shooting, fine. You have someone working on defense, fine. Right, I think you need people who are working on different skill sets who all come with different skill sets so that you can facilitate that learning process, that development process. Um, I will get into team building another day, but I guess my point is, is that just because Nurse is feeling the brunt doesn't mean that um, people haven't started talking about Masai or Messiah and Co. I think that they can do a much better job. I think in terms of talking about the nitty gritty, some people, there's certain 
theories flying around. Uh, maybe he's a micromanager or stuff. Um, it's possible. Um, I don't know enough. I fear that he might become a micromanager moving forward, but that doesn't mean, I mean, Pat Riley's probably a micromanager. I've heard of stories where he's literally goes to every game and has someone to go in between to tell them what to do. So it seems to work for some organizations. What I will say is that he is not always been the best at making progressive moves. We need to start making progressive moves and do that instead of being more reactive. I think when you're in always in reaction mode and always reacting to what's happening, you miss out on a lot. So that's the challenge that I would, you know, make to the to the Raptors organization. And again, I do think that Masai and Co are partially responsible for the season going the way that it did. I mean, the players are responsible for their thing too. I think there's a lot of blame to go around, but I do think that yes, just because I'm saying that Nurse deserves some of the blame doesn't mean that Masai gave Nurse the tools to succeed this season. Um, just like I don't think that Masai gave uh, some of the players the tools to succeed this season. Now, does that mean that I've lost faith in Masai? No, but I think that Masai and Co need to make certain moves this year. Um, I think that this offseason is very crucial. Um, and I think if you do that, I think you'll be okay. There is a pathway out of this, but the right moves need to happen now. And probably the first move that I would make is re-signing Siakam. I think after you do that, even regardless of whether you want to trade him in season or not, I wouldn't. I would try to make it work. But you can then start building around Barnes and Siakam. And I think if it doesn't work, now you're trading a guy who has four years left on his deal. Now you're looking at a Paul George trade instead of trading some guy who is expiring. It's much better asset management. So regardless of whether you hate a player, which people should not be hating players, or dislike a player so strongly, there is at least thinking of smart, good asset management. Now, does that mean that I think that they should re-sign everyone? Absolutely not. That is not what I'm saying at all. I think that they should definitely facilitate some sign trades, and I don't think that everyone should be back from this core. Um, but what I am saying is that it's in terms of the first thing that they should do or one of the first things on the, their agenda, it should be um, sign Siakam to a full max contract. It's not going to be a super max. I think it will scale well, um, and I think it will be a tradable contract within the next two years if, if you decide that you need to do that as well. But I also think that you're at least giving him the chance to say, hey, between you and Barnes, you guys have similar skill sets. Um, and you obviously expect Barnes to hit a much higher ceiling because he's doing what a lot of these guys are doing at a much earlier age. Um, and perhaps under a new coach, um, both players will be empowered, particularly Barnes, particularly Siakam will be empowered in different ways, of course, um, because both were, you know, my opinion, disenfranchised in different ways. Um, I think Siakam with just the lineups that he was given and um, Barnes, again, with the lineups that he was given and not saying, like, here's your well-defined role throughout the season. You know, there was times late at the end of games where it was like, okay, Siakam doesn't have, hasn't had the ball. You can't play. People will say, oh, he didn't, he only have five. Well, why did he only have three shots? Or why did he only have two shots? And other players have 10 I, that's weird that's partially on 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 management it's partially on 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 the coach on nurse um so i'm not absolving management at all i'm just they're not my public enemy number one uh if you will um to me that's that lies on on coach nurse um but yeah, so those are my thoughts. Um, if you have thoughts, if you disagree or whatever, um, this is kind of a conversation I want to have. Not, I'm not doing these lives um, yet. I might in the future. Probably not too many lives. I'm not really into the live format as much as just like kind of having the time to kind of think through my thoughts and then put them out there. But I will be doing lives at some point for sure um, here and there. Um uh, for as long as I can, because there will come a time when I have to kind of slow down the amount of time that I'm devoting to this channel. Um, but in the meantime, 
Um, this was fun. It's uh, fun to finally get my thoughts out. And I will be having more conversations like this um, and just kind of putting them out, but also having conversations about these things and topics with other people. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed this one. Again, like, comment, subscribe, um, and leave that stuff down below. And if there's a topic that I haven't covered this far uh, that is not draft related, because I will be getting back to that uh, scheduled content soon. Uh, if there's something that you wanted me to discuss, let me know. Um, and I will do my best to try to facilitate that. All right. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that's good and take care. Peace.